And I'm going to use this because it'll be annoying, I suppose, but I got to wander around up here. I had surgery on my leg the day before yesterday, and I'm not supposed to. The rule of thumb is you either uh, move around or you're on your back with your leg elevated. So I hope that's not too much of an annoyance for folks. But uh, yeah, um, the 800 pound gorilla, it's not getting smaller. And of course, by the nature of, of 800 pound gorillas, I'm not going to say what it is just yet. You may have some guess. By the way, book titles really get murdered a lot, but that one wasn't shoveling fuel for the train tracks. It was shoveling fuel for a runaway train. That was my first book. Run <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> And we'll see the relationship of the runaway train to the 800-pound gorilla soon enough as well. I don't know why this thing isn't working, but if you give me a long stick, I can... Oh, it's got to turn it on or something. It's a very nice... Uh, screen but you can't see what's on the screen just yet so you can see yeah they can see that first okay okay yeah. thank you yeah uh, Lester was great and uh, he you know he is such a worker he's going back to work now it sounded like uh, but that man is an encyclopedia of information on a lot of the stuff that I'm just going to allude to in the first few slides. Especially, of course, this issue, which he focused on and I guess is sort of a, at least a sub-theme of your conference. Uh, everybody know what that is? If you fly over vast stretches of the central plains, you're going to see it. It's pivot irrigation. And uh, anybody know what that is? That's the same thing. And that's in Saudi Arabia. So when Lester was talking about the big aquifers of the world, many of them being in deficit mode, that's certainly one of them. And so was the Ogallala Aquifer that was on the first slide. That was Kansas. But you know, it doesn't matter so much if a place has a lot of water or not, uh, it's being used. And it's being used for what? Well, largely, of course, as, as again, Lester made this point as well, it's primarily for agriculture. And we'll talk a little bit more about ag as we explore the 800 pounder. There it is on the ground. That's probably soybeans. And in fact, probably Roundup Ready soybeans. So not only do we have the water problem, but we have, you know, developing here one of the most unsustainable, fragile types of ecosystems imaginable. But, you know, this isn't all just about water. You know, water may be the lifeblood of the, I'm starting to hint toward what the 800 pounder might be. But, you know, it's not the only thing. Uh, you've got, that's, you've got the water issue, but you you have logging, you have mining, you have domestic livestock production, which again is where a lot of that water lifeblood went to. But, and we're skipping a long list of the parts of the gorilla to go straight toward the trophic top, if you will, namely the information sectors, uh, both in the hardware and software respects. And then, of course, you have the transportation that pieces the whole thing together, right? All the different modes and, uh, and different types of infrastructure in addition to, to transportation, the energy infrastructure and the water infrastructure. And, and then, of course, this is the other thing that would vie with water for being labeled the lifeblood of the kind of the energy itself. That's where it all starts, right? None of this activity would be happening without that. And you see some of the trends in that, in a nutshell right here. And then of course you have the other end of the tailpipe, the other, I guess you could say, going out the gorilla in a sense. 
And uh, so that's kind of the, the 800 pounder as you look around it, uh, around the world. So what would your one word summary of the 800 pounder be? It's the economy, friends. You know, it's, uh, it's the economy and it's a growing gorilla. It, people don't want to talk about the fact that it's the economy that is really uh, the source of, in, in my case, what it uh, appeared first of all to be the source of, in a problematic sense, was the cause of biodiversity decline in the United States. That wound up being a major part of my PhD research, which was a policy analysis of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, because otherwise, I would have been happy just staying a wildlife biologist and working in the field. But I wanted to try to get at uh, and make a bigger difference for biodiversity conservation in the United States. So that's why I did that, that uh, type of doctoral research. And part of it was looking at the causes of species endangerment in the United States. And those first 10 or 12 slides, you know, that summarizes it. It's the economy. The list of causes is like a who's who of the American economy. So it's the economy. Now since we're talking about this, and we're talking about that thing growing, we really have to start being careful with our definitions because if we don't, we'll get off onto all types of unproductive tangents and arguments and you know, time-wasting conversations. So let's just, uh, in some cases, inform ourselves, in, in a lot of cases, remind ourselves Economic growth is simply increasing production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. And so that means that it's expressed in terms of gross domestic product, or GDP. And that makes it easy to understand that it's a function of increasing population and or per capita production and consumption of goods and services. So that's economic growth. And that, that phrase, in the aggregate, that's the key phrase. Key in the sense of the phrase that is overlooked at our peril in discussions about sustainability. So, hey, what's, oh, there's the 800 pounder. Finally appears for us. That's the economy, so let's bring that. And you know, it's the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, I, my day job is with a federal agency. Are there any other federal employees in this room by chance? Oh, there is. Oh, <laughs> shucks. Well, let's. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed about you. <laughs> it, you can't talk about this now. Of course, I'm not here as a federal employee. That, in fact, that's the reason. CASSE, by the chance, that's the center, uh, by the way, is the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, CASSE. Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Steadystate.org, if you want the, the website. And uh, the reason CASSE was founded by me in 2003 is I had a gag order. I was not allowed to talk about the conflict between economic growth and environmental protection as a federal employee. And if there were very other many feds here, I wouldn't even say that here, but I am off duty. You know, you do have a First Amendment right and all that. So um, here's the gorilla coming out of the corner. Now we'll watch it grow a little bit. Okay, so that's economic growth. It's the whole thing. It's in the aggregate. It's an integrated economy with all of those sectors that we looked at examples of in the first some slides. That is not economic growth. And this is extremely important in discussions about sustainability. So if you hear somebody tell you that, well, you know what? There's no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. We can grow the solar sector 
while we decrease the fossil fuel sector, sorry folks, that's not economic growth. That's a, that would be called a sectoral readjustment. And a certain amount of that can happen, but not that amount, right? You have you know, certain rules in the trophic structure to borrow an ecological uh, concept that is every bit as applicable to Homo sapiens as to all of the rest of the economy of nature. You have certain thermodynamically derived rules in terms of the structural and proportional prospects of an economy. And so this is, uh, this is not economic growth, it's sectoral readjustment. That's economic growth in the aggregate. Now, in the, one of the problems that we have, and when I say we, I take it that if we had to try to put us all under one um, um, umbrella, what would it be? Environmental protection advocates? Would that be one of the, uh, okay, appropriate phrases? So we, I'll just call us environmental advocates. And one of the problems that we have is when we recognize economic growth as the problem, one of our initial reactions most likely is to say, well, this is a, this is a job for the economists to tackle then. Wrong. I don't, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of really good, progressive, helpful economists out there, but even they will tell you that the economics discipline at large, which we can call neoclassical economics, which very much dominates academia and government and government policy making and politics pertaining to macroeconomic policy, has a growth theory that's extremely out of date and short-sighted when it comes to the problems that we're trying to deal with by 2100. Because the growth theory, ever since Solo's 1956 model, which went through several major stages and you could say is now uh, uh, represented by the state-of-the-art Romer endogenous growth model, they all revolve around this, what we can call a landless production function. They all build from this production that says production is a function of capital and labor. What happened to the land? Remember, if you, if you know anything about the history of economic thought, classical economics and, you know, Adam Smith and Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill and all those, it was always, uh, the talk was always about land, labor, and capital. Land, labor, and capital. The first one is gone. What happened to the land? It's a really long story and by the way, speaking of long stories, I'm here with this book, Supply Shock. That's my, my latest book. I haven't written a lot of books, three of them. But that's the latest, and I spent on and off 14 years on the thing. And I do have, uh, uh, you could say, two chapters devoted to the corruption of this production function and how land got lost. It's a very sordid political tale entailing figures uh, like Henry George. Henry George is a central figure in this from the good guy side and then you have neoclassical econ and big money on sort of the bad guy side. It's pretty interesting really. And an example of how econ is really subject to corruption and even unto the academic efforts. Uh-oh, maybe I waited too long to do something or... Oh, okay, so they're solo and, uh, you know, notorious among we sustainability thinkers for his statement that the world can, in effect, get along without natural resources. So this gives you an idea why it was okay for him to leave land out of the production function, right? And basically he's talking about technological progress, which in a 20-minute talk we don't have time for. It's chapter six in Supply Shock, Technological Progress and Less Brown Growth, it's called. 
because you don't get green growth with technological progress and there's a very systematic explanation for that. You can get per capita what we might consider less brown growth, but remember, growth is all about the aggregate. So you're going to have environmental deterioration with increasing GDP even with technological progress. So Solo was, uh, you know, it wasn't his deal, environmental protection and land as one of the factors. But unfortunately, he spawned a long lineage of really landless thinking. My gosh, look at that. And you know where this, was, this statement occurred in 2002? At a banquet that would have dwarfed this one in this town, though hosted by the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Julian Simon Award speech, where big money was present to support this type of whatever you want to call it. Natural resources originate from the mine, not the ground, and therefore are not depletable. Oh. And you know, it doesn't stop just in academic circles. That type of academics empowers politicians at high levels, like at the VP level and higher. In this case, it was Jack Kemp back in 2000 as a VP uh, candidate, yelling practically with red face and white hair, we should double the rate of growth. And we should double the size of the American economy. Anybody remember that? It was crazy. I look crazy. At, and for any sustainability thinker, it is crazy. Um, but it's a natural outflowing of that landless production function. And here, here is the landless function in schematic form. You'll find this in introductory business textbooks, introductory econ textbooks. Uh, and here's your land, uh, you know, capital and labor. Capital and labor. And this is called the circular flow of money between the two factors. And so that's the vision of economic growth in conventional or neoclassical econ. That's why we don't go to them, at least at large, for help with this topic of the 800 pound gorilla. There's a certain specialty in econ that John is very familiar with, and, uh, and Lester was, and, and so on. Ecological economics, which by the way is having their uh, international societies meeting here in two weeks, not here, but in DC. And uh, for them, for us, in ecological econ, you know, we don't argue, we don't disagree that there is a circular flow of money. Why, sure there is. But we go back to reminding folks that it starts on the land. Five minutes, okay. So there's your circular flow of money. And we like to point out that yes, it occurs, but not in a vacuum, rather via the liquidation of stocks of natural capital, the water, the wood, water, soils, fisheries, minerals, petroleum products, all that. And pursuant to the second law of thermodynamics, it must result in waste production, both material and energy. So there's no free lunch. We can agree with that part with the standard economist. But we're going to add how that applies to environmental protection. With a wildlife or bio, who's, who out there is a wildlife, wildlifer? Jeez, I'm the only one it looks like. <laughs> no, no wildlife ecologists or Okay, well that's fine. So here's, here's sort of the summary of it in wildlife uh, conservation terms. As the economy grows, here it is coming out of the wilderness, preaching its ultimate carrying capacity. Uh, it's a process of reallocating that natural capital. The woods, the waters, the soils, the fisheries and all. All that natural capital had simply comprised wildlife habitats prior to the development of the human economy, starting about two million years ago, and then through evolutionary and ultimately agricultural and industrial processes when it really took off, you know, by then, 
uh, a great deal of the natural capital was being reallocated into the human economy, i.e. being converted into producer and consumer goods and services. Now the wildlife and fisheries professions have dealt fairly extensively with, with the topic. So if you uh, are interested in this, I, I would urge you to take a look at some of their products. But unlike the American Fishery Society, the Wildlife Society took the extra step of taking a position on it. Taking a position that was designed to refute that fallacious political rhetoric that you would hear often in the 90s that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. Remember hearing that? That was very prominent, you know, win-win rhetoric of the 90s. It was always fallacious. You don't hear it quite as much today, partly because of the efforts of some of these professional scientific societies. All right, so since we're talking about limits to growth and the need for something other than growth, well, first of all, what is it? You know, growth, well, what's, what is the optimum size? That would be your next question, right? And, you know, for some of us, it's probably already something in the past. Uh, and by the way, it's not just environmental protection. There are all kinds of things associated with GDP growth uh, that suggest that the optimum was passed for a lot of people other than just, you know, wildlifers and wilderness people. The general happiness of the nation was higher 50s, 60s, and 70s than it has been since then gone down, you know, uh, with GDP, and not entirely causally, of course, but maybe not not entirely as well. In fact, there's a lot of evidence for that being a, a causative agent. But, you know, if you're uh, someone that just doesn't care much about green space, you've got a little higher idea of what the best size for the economy is. So this is a job for a democracy. You know, in political science terms, which are pretty loose terms, right, you'd say you're going to muddle toward the optimum through policy, through politics, through consumer culture, all that. Another way of looking at it is, you know, the economy can grow and it's a good thing for a long time, but when it reaches a certain level, it's no longer doing us more good than bad, and you could even call that uneconomic growth when you get past that. It's kind of a rhetorical trick which I don't really encourage in general because then it just kind of muddies the water. But, it, but it's a valid notion. You know, when you get past the optimum, look at it this way, the marginal disutility of another increment of GDP growth exceeds the marginal utility. So it is uneconomic to continue pushing for GDP growth at that point. Here's another way of looking at it. I mean, the same way would have simplified. All right, we're almost done. So this obviously has uh, enormous policy implications, starting, starting with replacing the goal of economic growth. If it's become a bad thing, if it's causing more problems than it's solving, it's stupid to you know, keep pursuing that, right? So step number one, and th by the way, these are all in supply shock as well. You know, I had surgery on this leg a couple days ago. I have hard time lifting. You, you guys need to buy books. When, when you, okay? I'm, uh, if you're a student, you can make a good, a reasonable case for it. I'm going to give you a copy. And there's, you know... Otherwise, I'm, we're, we will sell them at author cost, which is 14 bucks, and it'll be the best 14 bucks you ever bought, ironically. But anyway, we talk in there about amending that Full Employment Act to a full and sustainable employment act, the Full Seas Act, if you will. So that notion of rising tide, lifting all boats, that's anachronistic. You, got, you only have so much water. You can only have so many boats. And so that's what that's about. And there's all these policies, but you know what? Before we even start talking about those, and I think this is the group for this, we got to talk about this. So 
anybody got an idea? Anybody take a vote for A? Would that work? That looks kind of unpromising. How about B? Ah, uh, that's too, I mean, it obviously em empirically demonstrated not to work. So that's the one. You got to put the horse before the cart, and the cart can't just start out with tonnage in it. You know, you, you got to have a gradualist approach to these policy reforms, and you got to have a big, strong, healthy political horse before you can start talking about loading up, much less pulling that cart. Okay. And finally, here's a basic vision. You know, you take the positions, that's, that empowers the NGOs. It gets out into the public and it gets into policy making. Read up on it if you would please a little bit, especially if you are like some sort of environmental professional or... And here's a good place to start. This is why we came into existence. We help develop those positions. You know, we have 13,000 signatories to our position. You can sign it here, please. Lester Brown just became our latest signatory, but you know, we got Gus Speth and Herman Daly and, and Vandana Shiva and Jane Goodall and David Suzuki, you know, a long list of dignitaries, uh, even into the political and diplomatic sphere have signed it lately. This is hot off the press pretty much less than a month ago. Uh, the Vermont legislature, you could say endorsed most of the Cassie position on economic growth. So, so it's a good place to start. Here's an example of the societies that have taken a position on it and some others looking at it. Oh, I did want to say something about political danger, but I won't say anything except to point out that don't be afraid of it. In poli-sci terms, you're in a diffused benefits, uh, I mean concentrated benefits, diffused costs, arena if you as an environmental advocate are advancing a position on economic nobody's going to come after you the costs are too diffused okay so uh the and the politics of the steady state are are the politics in political economy that are should prevail by the year 2100 if not it's like world war three and four time it's as simple as that. It's steady statesmanship or world wars. Thank you very much.